Wisconsin teacher licensing, causes and solutions to an impending teacher shortage. And our panel today will be Dr. Carrie Dassall, the superintendent of the Plymouth School System, Dan Mella, the assistant superintendent of the Plymouth School System, Jean Bourne, the superintendent from Sheboygan Falls, and Kevin Brudig, and I apologize, Kevin, if I got that name wrong, superintendent of the Oosbury School System. Dan, if you would like to come up, please, and introduce with your introductory comments, and you'll be introducing the panel as we go along. that to happen, 
you can make some big changes. So what do the numbers say? Currently, in this is information across, this is the whole country, where are we with teachers? Where do we have a, a gap? Maybe I'll read it, I know it's kind of small, there, there's some uh, small numbers up here. Just the big blue side says elementary education and teaching. Big, there's been a decline in education program completions over the last four or five years. Almost 18,000 uh, de uh, in uh, people that are going into education programs, a decrease. We've got a decrease in, in secondary education by over 4,000. These kinds of numbers indicate, and they're similar in the state of Wisconsin we'll get to, that we don't have kids going into education as a major in college. Yeah, I have a look. Okay? That's a problem. For example, teacher licenses in California, this is a nationwide issue, teacher licenses granted in California from uh, Title II from the uh, Department of Education, a decrease, a huge decrease. Teacher licenses granted in New York State, a huge decrease. But at the same time that we're having a decrease in the total number of <coughs> licenses granted, we're also seeing an increased need for teachers. That means there are more students, more programs, more, more places for them to be. So obviously you can see the gap. Less teachers are coming out or going into education programs. More teachers needed in schools throughout the country. And we've got a, we've got a gap. If you notice, the, it says all occupations. There's a, a predicted 14% need. That's all of us together. We're all, all of our workforces together. High school teachers, not as big of a problem as elementary and kindergarten teachers, where we seem to, there just are more of them to begin with. And so that's probably where the, where the variance happens. So we've got a gap, we've got a problem nationally. There's all kinds of discussion in our panel. We'll talk about this and they'll have ideas and you can ask questions about what to do about it, um, what do we think we should do about it. And for example, this is University of Virginia uh, study. It's a national survey looking at two different proposals. What, what should we do about a shortage? Um, should we, on the first hand, say, uh, as an example, forgive scholarships or college loans uh, to teachers that's on the bottom here that teach for at least four years in a low-income community or in a subject there where there is a shortage? So there should be that kind of loan forgiveness and those kinds of things. We have a couple of programs like that in the state of Wisconsin already, um, teaching in rural areas in northwestern Wisconsin. Um, there's a, a bit of a, a loan buyback tax credit pro program. So you can see a lot of people agree with doing that kind of thing, you know, serve people that are served by surveyed. But then uh, the second says, allow schools to hire individuals who haven't yet completed their training and earned a teaching credential. A lot less support for those types of things, where you just hire somebody who hasn't been through any kind of education training or those types of things. People don't, moms and dads, citizens, don't like to hear that as much. It sounds like they would like their teachers that are working with their children to have some expertise and some, and some background. What about some trends in the state of Wisconsin? Um, how many people in here are in manufacturing or have some sort of technical positions that they're hiring. Okay. Um, all of these, I included these because I've done a lot of work over the past with um, the, the skills gap and, and work with uh, the New Manufacturers Alliance. And so science certification students, math certification students, and world language because our, our technical, uh, our manufacturers are going global. So I just picked these three. They're all in shortage. Everybody is, is decreasing in the state. For, this is for students going into teacher education programs. It's a, it's a decrease everywhere, so we got a 30% decrease statewide, and that's private schools and public schools in the state of Wisconsin, colleges I'm talking about. But specifically for Sheboygan County, heavy, heavy manufacturing, international manufacturing, we've got even a bigger decrease. 
students going into science, math, world languages, culture. I mean, we're looking at over, to average those together, a fit, over a 50% decrease in just you know the last few years. So that's what's the that's what's in the pipeline for potential teachers to teach the students and to inspire the kids to go into those kinds of fields. Just as an example, Kevin and I started teaching, he started a little, he's a little bit older, so he started teaching a couple years before I did in 1990. I started teaching in 1992, so I, I just picked this. The uh, U.S. Department of uh, Ed has tracked areas of shortage in education uh, for you know, forever, as long as they've been doing it, as long as they could get that information. So I picked the year I started. So um, back when we started, Kevin, the only areas that were really in shortage were special ed and learning disabilities. Let's look at current. This year, you can see, again, manufacturing interests, healthcare interests, um, career and tech ed, business ed, all this, this whole list, in fact, the list continues. There are 22 total areas of shortage within education. That means there are predicted not enough teachers going through the system, to, whether it's the alternative system or the college-based system, to fill the potential need to teach students uh, in the state of Wisconsin. This information also, they have the same information for every state in the, in the union, so you can kind of look at it. It's a similar pattern, um, but we have um, a, lot of, a lot of issues, a lot of areas where we are going to be short <coughs> soon. And our panel will talk a little bit. They're going to be able to stay and talk a little bit more about the stories that they've experienced over the last few years of hiring and kind of what they're seeing and the trends that they're personally experiencing in hiring. But we've got shortage areas and a lot more of them than we used to. <clears throat> Kevin and I were talking about how much more competition there was for E and I to get positions earlier, so we're proud about that. We're patting ourselves on the back because we, we beat out a much larger field at that point. Um, last year, uh, over the last three years, we've had a 3% decrease. This is every type of teacher credential in the state of Wisconsin. We've had a 3% decrease just in the last three three years in total people credentialed as initial educators. Now, you would expect, looking at the previous numbers, that we ought to have less of a, we ought to have a bigger percentage right there because we've got such a decrease in the pipeline. But as our panel will talk about in a little bit, there are some alternative certification routes that people are choosing to go versus the traditional route, and, and they're going to have some opinions about the quality and makeup and outcomes from those compared to a traditional four-year, five-year, six-year uh, teacher education program. So, but there still is a gap that, that exists that, of initial teachers that we need compared to uh, what's out there. Another interesting trend that's been going on is that we've always had, traditionally, in the state of Wisconsin, we've been a net gainer of, of migrant teachers <laughs> into the state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin's always had a, a pretty strong reputation in education, and so over time, uh, we've had, in general, more people that have got, that have received their teacher um, training or have gone to university in another state coming here and getting their initial certification than we've had leaving. But since 2011, we have reverse that trend and we are now at a negative migration rate of 50%. So nearly 50%. So that's a big change. We're not getting help like we used to get either from people moving into the state uh, to come and live here. And uh, this is not dissimilar from many people in this room hiring for healthcare, manufacturing, and those kinds of things. We're seeing some of that as well. We've been working on addressing those problems and we've been partnering to try to address those problems. And we're trying to, we're hopefully going to just give you this information and maybe we can form partnerships and do something to deal with this problem as well. I have a graph that, oh there it is. I gave my 
myself a special effect and forgot about it. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, from Jim Morgan from the uh, uh, foundation. And he spoke at our meeting in summer. summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, this is a slide that uh, he had uh, provided for us uh, then and gave me permission to use. Just in general, our demographics in this state don't bode well. And we all know that. And so we're all in this together in that we've got labor demand, which is all of us. And the supply of, of people is not going to be potentially meeting that. So we have to figure out ways to, to deal with that. And so again, this is not a unique pro, uh, problem for us. It's also something that we've been working on together uh, for industry and uh, business as well. Plus, I mean, you've seen this one before. I think on the last presentation, we are we have a lot of migration out when the kids are young and a little migration back when the kids are older. And so the net result isn't a wash. We still are behind over time. And so we're losing our college graduates now out as teachers. They're, they're, some are coming back, but obviously you can see that not everybody's coming back. Now this is a backward looking uh, graph that you knows exactly what will happen in the future. And that's kind of what we're trying to address together uh, by you know, marketing and uh, someplace better and all the rest of the things we're working on together. Well, so we've got the issues of decreased teachers available and everything else. So kind of why is, why is that happening or what are some of the potential causes for that? Well, the, uh, the slide behind me shows the typical teacher program now that is a college-based program. And the, obviously, just like all other uh, costs for post-secondary education, those have increased, just like everybody else's. However, a major change that's occurred in the world of education, when Kevin and I went through school uh, for education, when, when you did as well, you didn't, we didn't have Praxis, uh, Praxis Core, Foundations of Reading, Praxis Two, Ed TPA. Those are all endpoint cutoffs. There are exams that you take on your way through the, through the system. Um, I believe they're all, uh, all of that money goes to <coughs> Pearson. They're all Pearson-based tests. And so as you move through the system, you might be doing fantastically well, or, uh, and, and then you take a Foundations of Reading exam. The, the stats on that are about 40% all of students that take it in the state of Wisconsin have to retake it. It's one of those things like the bar where you can take it and again and again and again until you pass. Um, but there's a high percentage of people that take it again and again and again until they pass. And so there's a cost every single time you take that. And there's a, um, there's a potential barrier and, and some discouraging um, or some, some things that stand in your way from you wanting to work with kids to actually finishing your degree. And those exams are kind of, in, just in my opinion, they're unproven, and there is uh, some, there's quite a bit of debate, and there's some research that shows that they're not really correlated to ultimate teacher success. But kids got to take it. They have to take all those things for additional expense, so there are additional barriers to actually finishing and completing a degree. What else is going on? Well, we, we all know that nobody goes into education because they want to get rich. Um, but this as a percentage of, this is an interesting graph if you look at countries across the world and how people are uh, compensated for their work. This is the, a, a ratio of salary for anybody who earned a college degree um, in these countries after 15 years of experience and full-time, full-year work. And so you can see in the United States, uh, we are right here, um, we are 0.6, that's a ratio, so we're over half, way to a full one, uh, uh, different than, uh, that was good math, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, from what typically people would earn that have a college degree moving towards uh, ever after 15 years of work. So we all know that there's not a great financial, there never has been a great financial reward for, for teaching. Um, but then you compound that with this problem, which is MetLife study, they've been doing this for since the 60s, looking at job satisfaction of all kinds of labor force throughout 
And so just taking a look at the, the teacher one, job satisfaction among uh, teachers has reached an all, uh, a 25-year uh, low. And um, if you look at some of the reasons and, rat and, and studies that, that look at that as well, it relates to things like standardization of the profession, you know, things that are coming from the accountability movement uh, are, are a problem for people. Um, autonomy within the profession, you just earned a bachelor's degree, you're somewhat of an expert, and then you go into the teaching world and Carrie and I tell you exactly what to do, how high to jump and how low to swim and everything else. I'm not saying that we do that, we try not to do that, but there's a lot more of that in education than there used to be. Um, and then there's the public perception problem, and I kind of equate this to uh, the same uh, issues that manufacturing has, and we, always, we talk about this in our new manufacturing alliance meetings, and uh, when we're talking those kind of types of uh, issues, you know, the old manufacturing, dark, dirty, uh, you know, kind of a no, no future type of thing that we're trying to dispel and get rid of because it's a lot better, it's a lot of chance to grow, it's not that same environment that your parents heard about, it's great. Well, we've got that kind of issue that's developed over the last few years, um, not the last few years, but o over time about teaching as well. Um, I think Kevin might talk to this a little bit later, but there are uh, perceptions out there that it isn't a, it isn't as uh, meaningful a, per a, a profession. Uh, teachers are uh, somewhat, um, they're, they're not looked on as, looked upon as fondly as maybe in, in, in the past. And so we, there's just work that needs to be done to make it that for people to understand that it still is a noble profession and, and it can be a wonderful calling and all this stuff that you see in the news media and, and, and the blog posts out there are you know, not true or that there are other ways to look at things. So we need to do a better job of, of, saying, of, of espousing the, the positives for, for education. So that's kind of where we are. We've got less teachers coming through college We've got greater demands on the, on the back end, and so somewhere in the middle we've developed a, a gap, and so we're experiencing a shortage. So what are we going to do about it? That's what the panel is going to talk about a little bit. They'll explain about their, what their thoughts are about the, the issue, and then um, um, you can ask questions as well. So that was my part with the background. All right. So one of the things we didn't see before, at least I didn't see before, is we'll, we'll have people sign contracts in April and continue going out applying for positions and looking for better options. And that may have been maybe commonplace in, in the private sector. It was not as common in education. And we'll be left with people who we think we've got in place in August having to flip gears, maybe even September, particularly in the high demand areas. So we're looking at creative ways in terms of our contract, how can we expose people to our culture earlier, those kinds of things have really been part of it. So late resignations, I think the other thing that we're seeing is a lot more moving between local school districts. And we, con we continually, it's a big debate, our superintendents group uh, really I think gets along well, supports one another, but it's also we have a responsibility to our students and the idea of, uh, you know, pulling teachers from other districts and what that means 
if they're in front of kids somewhere, they're making a difference. So if, if we take a, a great teacher from Plymouth and they can't fill that position, they're all our kids. And we try to have the mentality of the Oosburg kids are not the, they're not the only kids that matter. They're all our kids. So just changing demographics uh, in terms of demand, changing dynamics in terms of contracts have been a few of the things that we're seeing in that regard. And, and I concur with Kevin. I want to thank everyone for having us here today. This is a really important subject. And I've been in education for 30 years. So um, I'm, it's my life. It's what I do. It's my passion. And um, I will say that over the last maybe five years or so, um, it, it's been it's been disheartening to me to see some of the things that Dan's talked about and and live it and and hear the voices of the teachers and be able to try to help them understand that they are still valued and that they still have a very noble profession. Um, so we do as Kevin said, try to build a culture for that to happen within our school district in, in many different ways. Probably the trends that we've seen the most, um, I can tell you that if if you would have asked me about three or four years ago to hire an elementary teacher, I would probably have had 350 applicants. I probably now have about 50, which is okay. I mean, we can still, we can still hire elementary pretty well. Um, if you're looking at the areas of special education, technical education, agriculture, business ed, um, it, they're, they're pretty few. Last year, I know we only had five agriculture teachers graduate from the agriculture program in the state. So if you're looking for an agri teacher in agriculture, you're, um, you're, you're really not going to get someone. And I, I will also tell you that the closer it gets to the beginning of the school year, the more difficult it is to find teachers. And at that point in time is when you really do um, do the thing that you don't want to do is you, you, you hire teachers that don't have the qualifications or even the, um, sometimes even the certifications that you need them to have. And you provisionally license them and, and then next year try again if you can try a little earlier. But we do see that trend happening a little bit more. Um, the other thing that I will tell you is that Kevin spoke about the transferring of teachers from one school district to the other later in the game. And that happened all the way up through October at times and maybe even more into the school year. And the thing that that concerns me, the, the reason why that concerns me is that if you look at the research, when a teacher changes in a classroom for a student, oftentimes you'll see a significant amount of the students lose up to three months of education backslide that you have to pick up and be able to, to change because of the transition, because of the student having to think differently with a different teacher in the classroom. So when a teacher leaves the classroom to go to another school district because they're getting a better offer, if you will, in October, it really isn't you know, the best interest of the kids and that's really what we're here for. And that concerns me a lot when we start getting into that cycle. I too would like to thank you for this opportunity. I think we're, we're in a position now where we have to really look creatively at, at what we're doing with our staffing and understanding that this shortage does have a direct impact on what we do with our students and the programs we can offer. I can't, I will echo exactly what Carrie and, and Kevin have said. The thing, I, I guess the trend we're seeing too is that we're starting to look for internally at our own staff to see what other skills they have and can they move into some of the positions that we don't have. Or can we grow them internally? Can we take an elementary teacher and grow he, him or her to be a science teacher at the high school? So we're really starting to look at that. We also are working with partnerships with UW Sheboygan LTC. We were working with them before, but it's, a, it's taken on a different tack. Um, two years ago, Sheboygan Falls did not leave lost a tech ed teacher and, um, to a neighboring district, which as Kevin said, we, we do work closely together and they are all our kids. And that's how we have to look at it. This is, we don't want to be competitive, but unfortunately that does happen sometimes. So we went to LTC and said, you know, what can you do for us? How can we work together to, to make this happen? And LTC was able to provide us with an instructor and we were able to you know, formulate our program and not lose that program because that's a really popular program in our, in our school. Um, but we're really starting to see more of that. We're also looking at people who are not educators and uh, maybe that are members of our community or other people in our community or other people that we know. And would they be interested in considering a job in teaching? And here's what you have to do. Here's how we can help you. 
we brought people in, the shadow teachers, to say, you know, is this something that you would like to do? Um, even former students who have gone into teaching and then said, nope, this is not for me, invite them back to say, hey, would you like to shadow today? And you know, go back to your elementary, work with your teacher that you had, you know, 10 years ago. Um, we're just trying to find creative ways to to engage the profession again. And and I, I think as we mentioned up here too, we have a responsibility to engage our own students and our communities about our schools and about how important education is. Um, education is the cornerstone, and I truly believe that. I'm a lifetime person also in education. This is my 30th year. Um, I have a daughter going into education, and my husband and I are both educators, and you know, when she came to us and said she wanted to be a teacher, it was like, okay, take a deep breath, but yes, she's got the passion, she's, got, she's driven, she's got some natural ability. Why wouldn't I want her to do this? Because all kids deserve good teachers. So I think that's, we're, we're really just trying to be more creative. We have to look out of the box. And I guess at this point in time, we certainly understand what many of you have been saying for a long time in manufacturing and other areas, healthcare, about how difficult the shortage is making your jobs and to produce what you want to produce, the quality you want to do. And, and we're seeing ourselves in that position more and more every day. I guess I'd like to just follow up on the perception thing a little bit. Uh, American Society Quarterly does a Harris poll. Harris does a poll on their behalf. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel had this out recently. And so just alluding to what Dan had shared about the perception, because I think it's something that we need to work together. And just a, a segue before I share just a couple of pieces from the survey. My my position in my role as district administrator has really expanded the opportunity to work with local businesses in Mooseburg and, and we just recently joined the Sheboygan Chamber. Those partnerships were things that I was not aware of as, as a teacher and particularly as a building principal. They have been phenomenal. So we share so many of the same challenges. And I think the great analogy is the concerns of perceptions around manufacturing that have been mentioned a couple times today. And we're, we're suffering with those same challenges. So what are the opportunities for us to flip that around? I, you know, just think that the older I get, the toughest days are the ones where we grow the most. So I, I look at the big hurdles that we have and think there's really an opportunity for neat things to happen in the next four or five years. And that's exciting. So here's a couple of the things from the survey that was in the Journal Sentinel. 90% of parents would encourage their children to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and math, but not teaching jobs in those fields. So that's a concern. In a separate survey of just educators, just educators talking about their children, only 29% of people who are actually in teaching would encourage their kids to go in. So we've got a problem internally where we have to be responsible. When we find ourselves talking negatively, complaining, whatever, we've got to flip that around. That's our responsibility and us. So I think that that's really a concerning thing. 55% of the parents were more likely to encourage uh, would be more likely to encourage a career path to teaching if the compensation was better. 70% of, of parents and 77% of educators worried that their child wouldn't make enough money as a teacher. I think that's a message we have to flip around too because it's, it's not about that. I mean, it, it's not about, we want to have, so it's a perception thing. They certainly want to have family sustaining wages, but we have some challenges there that have to be flipped around as well. So. I really think that uh, those are hurdles that we can work through together as our partnerships continue to grow. I was talking with a school board member from Green Bay just recently. The current cohort of graduates in the education program at UW Wisconsin Green Bay, none of them are going to stay in Wisconsin. All of them are moving out. So that's related to that perception thing. You talked about the migration out that, that Dan mentioned. And I think we're also seeing <coughs> leadership wise. So just a little bit of background for me. My dream was to be a teacher. I never considered or had aspirations of being a district administrator, but our system was set up that you moved up in the salary schedule by getting more credits. So I went and got my master's degree, got my master's degree from Lakeland, got a certification in administration, and then that opportunity opened. I think, you know what, I think I think this is a doorway I should, should try to walk through, and it's been good. Right now, graduate programs across the state are just, they're, they're non-existent. In, in ed leadership. So we're not seeing that pipeline. It hasn't been talked about, but I think great leadership is going to inspire good teachers as well. So it's all connected together. So just some changes in dynamics and, and growing our own leaders internally. And I think we can probably learn best from our business partnerships and what that can look like and not be stuck in our ways. That's certainly happened in healthcare. We have, we have 
the lowest health care costs in, in our CESA. And a lot of it is things that the business community has, has done you know, several years before us. And we're learning. We may learn slowly, but we're, we're getting there. My question is, what are potential solutions that maintain and improve the quality of teachers earning their license to teach? Okay, this, this particular question I think is, um, is tricky because um, certainly I know that the slide that Dan put up that showed all the tests and everything that um, teachers have to go through in order to get their teacher's degree, he talked about them as barriers, and I, I guess I would agree with him on that, that they are barriers in a sense in which they don't necessarily correlate to what happens afterwards. It's something, you know, it's like some of the tests we take, like the ACT test, for example, correlates very well with what you took in high school, but there isn't any good research that's independent of the ACT company that says that having a high ACT is going to make you successful in college. Um, so, so he's right about the, um, the, the assessments and stuff that the students have to take, but I always worry about when we start dwindling the quality of what we're what we're producing as far as highly qualified teachers go. Um, te the, the, the profession of teaching is very complex. You have to inspire, you have to engage. You, you know, even though you're a technical education teacher, you still have to learn how to teach technical reading. You have to learn how to use applied math. You can't just be um, someone who knows how to weld, but you have to be someone who knows how to weld, who knows engineering, who knows construction, and can teach five different things in a day. It's very complex. And I will tell you that um, I went to an operations roundtable, I think, two or three months ago, and we were talking about the shortage. And John Rogers did ask, has anyone around the table lowered the quality or the expectations of the people you're hiring in order to fill the shortage that you have for um, employees? And no one raised their hand. I mean, everyone still expects to have a highly qualified employee come through their door, and they're not going to lower their quality or their expectations because it's very important for them to have quality people. Well, I can tell you that I see that trend happening in education, and it scares me. It, it really does. Um, we now have a, a law in our state that allows someone to be able to come in and be a technical education teacher without a bachelor's degree, without a teacher's license. Um, and and it, it is very scary, and I know that um, maybe we're desperate, but I think that that desperation can't impact us to a point where our students are going to suffer. And, and I think eventually we have to take a stand and say enough. That being said, I do think that there are some quality alternative programs out there that can take people, as Jean said, that have different levels of, of education and bring them in and we can help them get that teacher license in a highly qualified manner. And they don't always have to take the traditional route. Um, I also think that there should be some incentives for students to be able to go into the teaching field and one of the, the loan buyback program, I know I read some research the other day where they talked about using some of the interest from the federal um, loans where the students are paying from the college loans and being able to give some payback to students who stay in education in certain um, hard-to-find areas. But I think that there are some solutions out there. I'm concerned that we're jumping too quickly to solutions, and, and in turn what's happening is um, we are going to have uh, an issue in our classrooms with our students. And, and everyone says, well, as a superintendent, you know, you have the ability to hire who you want, you know, local control, which I'm all for. But, um, but I can tell you that it isn't local control anymore when um, teacher colleges are shutting down. Right now, we have two teacher colleges in the state for technical education teachers, and one of them is already down. Plattville, at this point, doesn't have enough students going into technical education to be able to run their teacher ed program. So now we have Stout left. And as those programs continue to shut down, our ability to hire highly qualified people continues to diminish. So we have to be really careful when we start jumping to solutions and finding solutions that make sense and not solutions that are quick fixes and are going to in the long run hurt us. I guess the only thing I would add to that is I think you know, working internally with our own staff and trying to grow our own has, has been really effective for us. I think the other thing is we have to really take a long, hard look at the programming that's out there to prepare teachers. Um, as I look at my daughter's programming through her college, and I'm, I'm looking at all the different things that she has to do and, and knowing the practical application she needs to learn, the applied piece, um, we need to make sure that we're giving those people that go into education, those students that go in, that are getting a really good, solid experience, and that see 
what the what the teaching profession really is all about. There's so many positives, and and sometimes I don't think they get those experiences, and I think that's in one area. I also think going back to what I said before, and I think we would all agree, we have to make sure that we're promoting our profession in a different way. We have to be positive about what it is we do every day. I don't go to work every day for 30 years thinking this is a job for me. This is this is my passion. This is what I have to do. And I have many people say to me, how do you do this every day? How do you come back the next day to do this? And you probably have people say that to you as well. But it's something I believe strongly in. And I think we have, as educators who have a strong passion for our profession, just as you do in your, your work areas, we need to instill that. We need to make sure that we are sharing that on a, on a, a positive way and on a more regular basis. I think the connections that we have made, as Kevin had spoke to very eloquently about you know, working with businesses, working with other entities, I'm excited about the Someplace Better as our Sheboygan County group gets together as superintendents and we talk about how do we promote education in Sheboygan County. It's not about Oostburg versus Plymouth versus Sheboygan Falls. It's about how do we show people coming to Sheboygan County that the education system, the public schools and all schools in Sheboygan County are very strong and, and that they're doing a good job in supporting their kids. And so I think those are some of the other things that we have to continue to do. And, What kind of questions would you have that we could take from the group? Yeah, Austin from Shibuya County Economic Development Corporation. Um, I guess one of my questions would be, we touched on a lot of um, how to prepare students to get them interested in it, but I didn't hear a lot about recruitment efforts to Sheboygan County in general. I heard Plattville and I heard UW TV. I didn't hear, you know, we were talking about agriculture, I didn't hear UW River Falls. What kind of recruitment efforts do we do? We go on site to colleges and recruit in person by showing them someplace better materials. You know, what, what kind of recruitment efforts do we do on site trying to attract people to our area? Because we know once we get people here, we can keep them. But how do we get them here and how do we make that connection? I think that's a, that's a great question and one that part of the answer would be when Dan and I applied for biology teaching positions, we had 100, you know, there were 100 applicants, you had 300 for an elementary position. So we've been stuck in the mud and just expecting people to come to us. Right and we've been slow learners. So I can tell you in the last few years for us, it's been a dramatic difference in terms of how we've proactively recruited, going to, going to different job fairs, being in regular contact with universities across the state and sometimes even out of the state. We're seeing more school districts that are proactively recruiting. When I was serving as elementary principal, I would get a, a, a brochure from Kimberly School District just about once a month explaining an open administrative position that they had those kinds of things, using things like LinkedIn, uh, those were not the norm in education. And I think we're learning that, hey, we need to we need to get on the ball and not just expect people are gonna show up at our door. So I think you're seeing a big change in an area that we did very poorly for a long time, but we have a long way to go in that. Austin, I can tell you that um, some of the things that, that we've done, about two years ago we started to notice that as the students were graduating and they had to declare what it was that they wanted to go to school for, we were down to maybe one student a year that was interested in going into teaching. So we now, for the last two years, we have a, a course that we actually teach for juniors and seniors and it's kind of conducive to Education 101. We work with the um, UW Sheboygan to work with it and we have students who enroll in that class and we help them understand more about what teaching is and what a great profession it can be in. And, and, and of course some of the things that they're going to experience. This year I think we have, um, I think, seven students that I was able to count and I think that we're seeing that grow a little bit. We also, last night, held our own job fair at, um, at Horizon Elementary School for anybody who is interested in being an elementary teacher and what we do is we bring our um, our best of the best there and we have little centers that the, that the um, candidates can go through and interview, talk about math, talk about um, language arts, how do you teach language arts, what's the math program that you use, talk with the principals, talk about interpersonal skills that we value. And I, I think it was pretty successful. Again, this is our second year doing it, but we pretty much just put an invite out for everyone to come and, and and just walk through because we do believe that we can not only bring people in because of salary, but we can bring people in because we have a culture that they're going to enjoy and like. And if we can expose them to that culture, then maybe they'll get excited about teaching with us. So, I guess I would echo the things that they said. The, the one thing that's weirdly happened in our district these last couple of years is that when people have come to us and, and taken a position, 
they're actually going out and recruiting people that they've worked with before. Come to this school district, it's a great place to work, which we've not seen before, we've not had, we really haven't had to have that. Um, we are, as, as they both have said, we're continuing to put efforts together. That's just not something we've had to do. When you put out a position and you get 50 or 60 applicants, you're hoping out of those applicants you're going to find a quality person, and you do. So that, that's a rethinking, a retraining of, of how we do it. But I'm, I'm excited that our own teachers are going out purposefully and saying, this is a great place to work, you want to come to Sheboygan Falls. So that's exciting, and I'm telling them to expand their message to say Sheboygan County, because it, it's all of us, it's just not Sheboygan Falls, although I'll take the good teachers if they come, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what kind of dialogue is taking place with UW uh, management leadership about kind of trying to change perception? Because when you talk about salary, salary depression, I mean, that's, I think, across lot of areas, a lot of university degrees do not reap the salaries they once did. So it's not just a, I think, a, uh, an issue to teaching, mm -hmm. but I don't know, it's, I, I, I'm curious as to what UW leadership is doing to try to help change that perception and retool students to occupations that have the ability to have their jobs and benefits the only thing that I've seen so far is in working with UW Sheboygan. They, you know, they've created being a two-year college. They've created some four-year degrees that that stay local. They're getting, you know, people out into the, the classrooms earlier. They're doing things like that. But I don't think a formal conversation with the UW system has happened between us. Um, I just see some of their efforts are more aggressive, getting getting out and looking for educators. I, I'm really impressed with what UW Sheboygan is doing. They see the need, they're willing to work with us, and they have some of us to teach the courses they have. Um, they're getting into our schools more um, early on in this in the four-year degree. Um, that's about the only example I, that I have. I guess the one example that I think we've seen locally is the uh, um, partnership between Lakeland and STC. And the fact that we can actually ha help our students who are interested in the technical education areas get that degree with a combined effort between the two um, places. And I know when I was reading the students as they were leaving and what they were looking at um, doing in their um, career, I noticed that one of our teachers inspired um, one of the students and he wants to be a technical education teacher. So I went to Dan and said, let's get him in that program quick. You know, because that way we can keep them here and hopefully when one of our teachers leaves, we can have someone waiting in the wings to teach for us. But um, but I, I think, you know, that's probably a really good um, thing that we have to start talking about because when they do talk with the UW system, they just throw their hands up and say, you know, um, more what teacher colleges or teacher programs are closing down all over the place. And that's what I'm hearing. But you're right, we probably need to take a better look at it. I really think it needs to start so much earlier, and it is. You know, by the time that it's too late for the discussion by the time we get to the university level. So we're we're talking very significant changes in the state around academic career planning starting in sixth grade. And you know, Dan mentioned the youth apprenticeship uh, program. We're we're heavily involved in that as well. So I think when we talk about you know young people graduating with hundred thousand dollar or more worth of debt and potential options for a career, you know, there's just a mismatch there. We, we need to take responsibility. If, if we wait for or even coach or put that responsibility on the university systems, it's way too late. We need to be doing that with our kids, and I think we are. And again, it's another example of really good partnerships between business and education, where we're not only, our most recent discussions were not only around expanding youth apprenticeships, but then co-ops. There's some really neat things happening with Sheboygan School District and Red Raider Manufacturing that have now expanded to all of the districts in the county, and I, I think we're on a really good path. So I, I think we need to own that. We need to own that at our level. Could you comment on the practice exam? <laughs> Well, what, what exactly would you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'd like to know why you reacted that way. <laughs> um, it, it's an exam. It's basic. It, it's reading, math. It's something that the students take in order to they get to a certain point. Actually, twice within their um, college career to be a teacher, they have to prep. They have to pass two exams, and then the, the, I guess those exams aren't really 
in my mind as bad as, um, and Dan, Dan probably feels differently and that's okay, and diverse opinions are excellent, but, um, but I think for me the, the worst one is the Ed TPA, and I have to be very careful, but the Ed TPA is a, it's where the teachers have to um, videotape themselves, and then they have to do some reflection on the on the videotape and and it's three hundred dollars and if they don't do it right the first time they have to do it again and again and again and um i guess i i, I wonder what we could do with the money that is being paid for these types of things and 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 maybe making our teachers better when they get to us in the professional development and even compensating them better. But um, I think that sometimes there's these areas, it's just like standardized testing, where, you know, why why does every student have to take the ACT when not all students are going to a college education? And um, I always will question, you know, who who is benefiting from that particular um, rule? And is it really the students? Does this really make the teachers better? Does it really make the students better? And I would probably say that we should look into that and see. <laughs> the reason I reacted that way is because I think we're making young people jump through hoops. And a lot of people are making a lot of money off of roadblocks for kids. I'm not saying that the assessments themselves don't have some merit. But that doesn't seem to be the primary motivation. So I have a little bit of a negative reaction when I hear that because I don't think it's uh, necessarily as altruistic as, as what it's portrayed to be, and it presents a roadblock. Yeah, I, I think when you look at the amount of money that goes into the accountability issues with education, I, I really believe that that's taking a huge chunk of what we could be putting in to making the profession so much better. And, and we not that there shouldn't be any accountability, but it has to it has to make sense, and it's gotten way out of control. Are those titles mandated by the state or on a federal level? State. state. Who's the state? Who, who mandates it? Um, if we could do PIA, I think our legislators. I, it's both. It's both it's because a, like Ed TPA came in with raised the top. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of a, a lot of what you see coming in, it has to do with the waiver for the no child left behind, and and then the waiver was written so that um, in in 2014 all schools had to be 100% um, proficient in so many areas like closing the gap, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then a waiver was written for the no child left behind law. And within that waiver, there were um, a lot of hoops that we had to jump through in order to, to, to not have to follow that no child left behind piece. And um, it, it, it's so convoluted and, and complicated. Um, yeah, even when you, even when you look at the, the, at the report cards and stuff that the school districts now receive, a lot of what um, you get exceeds expectations, meets expectations. A lot of times you can be in a low performing school district and exceed expectation because you closed the gap. And when you close the gap, what that means is that the gap between the students who are achieving very high and maybe the low socioeconomic students or um, the students with disabilities who are achieving lower, you close that gap. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're doing a better job. It just means that you're closing the gap. So you can have a lower top group and and uh, um, so 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 it, there's so many things that you know convolute, and that's part of you know what happens to teachers in the profession is that you know they're evaluated on these things and they have to close the gap, but yet they have to leave the students who are up here you know sort of behind because we're working at closing that gap because if not, then the report card says we're not doing a good job. So a lot of things like that. I would tell her that there's no better profession in the world. And I would tell her that no other profession would exist without the profession of teaching. There's nothing like a hug from an elementary kid. And it's really hard.
hard to have a bad day in an elementary school. Uh, if you're having a bad day, go to a kindergarten room for a while and yeah. everything seems okay. Uh, but it's kind of like having grandkids because you don't have to keep them. You know? <laughs> uh, so. I would echo what Carrie said and, and Kevin said. It, it is the best profession. There's there's wor not a lot of words to ha have that feeling when you see a child learn to read for the first time or to learn something that they've been struggling with for the first time. It is it is certainly not just a job. It's a passion. And it, you get that warm, fuzzy feeling every day, even as a superintendent, when that 4 k -er comes and blows his nose on the side of your pants. It's pretty exciting because he's pretty excited about something. So it's you just get that warm, fuzzy feeling. And it's, it's hard to replace it with anything. And I would also say, because my, my journey was element, or middle school teacher, then I was an elementary principal, and I remember um, those students who, they, they struggle, they can't, they're the first grade students who, they're just not reading, and they're just not reading, and we're doing everything we can to get them to read. And come around January or February, it clicks. And before you know it, it's like, whoa, you know, they just take off. And there's no other feeling when you see something like that happen. But then when I went into, um, I, I, for a while I was the assistant superintendent in dance position and my job was to teach teachers. And when I see those same types of aha moments in an adult, I get that same feeling. So, so all the way through, you know, teaching is just one of those very rewarding professions. And I guess the last thing I would tell her is don't believe everything she hears. Yeah. Talk to people who are doing the job and find out for herself if that's what she wants to do. Good with the one sentence thing, so I'll add one more thing as well. I think all of us have experienced that there's really nothing that brings more joy than when we can do something for somebody and they're not going to give us anything in return. Just the, the, the satisfaction that comes from service, and that is, I don't know another profession other than education that provides as many opportunities for that and, and, and to watch kids grow. But um, you know, that, that satisfaction, uh, I can't imagine another profession that parallels that. One suggestion before we wrap up, as we're as we're thinking about this, and I don't know how often you're looking for topics, but uh, I would I would think that school funding would be an awesome topic to have a first Friday forum. Not not from the standpoint of people from schools coming up and asking for more, more money. The complexity of school funding, I think, could be really valuable to have a discussion about. Uh, I, Devin Lemahue and, and Terry Kotsmar are from Oostburg. And we have spent a lot of time with them, helping them to understand it is extremely complex. So I wouldn't want the focus to be around, we need more money, around just the value in collective members and stakeholders in the community understanding how that works, how it's changed, uh, all those kinds of things. Uh, so I would, I would uh, just toss that out there for whatever it's worth if you're ever looking for topics. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And if you'll give me just a couple seconds for a couple quick announcements after saying thank you to our panel again for coming to speak with us in such an authoritative manner. Tonight there will be a ribbon cutting beginning at 5 p.m. at the Solu Estate Winery at County Road F at Cascade. Our June focal point topic will be Tap into your entrepreneurial spirit, which will be held at the Sheboygan Chamber on Wednesday, June 15th, 7.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Our panels will be from the SEDC, SCORE Mentors, and the SBDC. Over lunch hour on June 15th from noon to 1.30, we'll be having a hot topic presentation and a Q&A on the new minimum salary rules from the Department of Labor. June, Business After Hours will be rebuilding together at the Harbor Lights on Wednesday, <coughs> June 29th at 5 p.m. And I'd like to encourage you for the first Friday Forum in July, don't come. <laughs> there will be no first Friday Forum in July. You have the month off. But please do join us in August for a discussion on the Affordable Care Act health care reform. I think that will be a very interesting and timely topic as well. Thank you for coming. And please, come again in August.